Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. I thought, I thought um, it would have been better than that. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Are you happy to be in the courts of the Lord? Yes. Just lift your hands and praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Indeed, Pastor is right. Myself and the family, we are happy to be here. And he has been, been expressing how much he is grateful for the help. And um, as I've been observing, I can tell you that you have, you have had a good past over the years, for six years. Dr. Robinson has been leading this church, and I believe he has been doing a great job. What do you say? And I want to commend him for the work he has been doing and for the wife who has been, his wife who has been supporting him thoroughly as he leads this great church. Again, before I get into the message, I must also commend uh, the church and its, the leadership for uh, the great welcome we had last week. I felt all the love and the warmth, and um, I've been excited to come back here. My, my wife is excited, son is excited um, that we're here today. I must also commend my wife and say a big thanks to her for the way she has been supporting from I've been in ministry until now. Um, I, I can't complain. God has blessed me with a lovely wife. Yes, I can't complain. I didn't tell her this morning. I wanted to say it publicly. Um, but but, but I, can't ask, I can't ask for more. Um, she has been spoiling me. And um, because she has been spoiling me so much, sometimes I find it so hard to think outside of her. So I've been always calling her whenever I, I, I have to make some uh, important decisions. But I must say thanks to her for the love she has been granting to me from where I've been married until now. And also must commend my son uh, for his patience. You know, ministry can be, can be, can be troublesome sometimes. Uh, troublesome in a good way. But, but um, um, business and so on. But he has been patient and he has been enjoying uh, ministry. So I must say thanks to him also publicly. Let us get right into the word of God. I can't wait to meet you all, to know you all by name and, and to know your story and for you to know my story. I can't wait, but we'll get there, and we'll get there gradually. Uh, again, we get to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, just take your Bibles as I read these verses for you, again, so that you can digest these words. And I must commend the membership too. I, I, I've been to a lot of communions, and when it, when it, when it comes on to communions, church is normally scanty. But I must commend you for the way church is looking today. You are excited to be a part of the communion service. I must commend you. Ephesians chapter 2. Are you there? Ephesians chapter 2. And I'll be reading again for you from verse 1. I'll be reading from the King James Version. I know that many of you have that version. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we, rather, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace he are saved. Verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us, are you, are you with me? Which verse am I? So you're with me. Made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace, ye are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of who? God. Not of works, lest any man should what? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto God. Good works, rather. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 
Our message is entitled, But God. But God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. But God. I would say that I grew up uh, with a second generation. My, my mother would consider her a second generation Adventist. Uh, she believed in morning worship. And uh, myself, brothers and sisters, we had to get up every morning at 5 a.m. Even when it was holidays, were holidays, we had to get up at 5 a.m. You now, growing up as a child, as a youth, you know that when you're, you're on holidays and you have to get up at 5 a.m., that's a miserable moment. But my mother, was, she was determined that we should have worship every morning. And she would get up and she would walk in the room, she would call us. And she said, I'm, she normally said, I'm giving five minutes for you to get up. And she would go in the living room or sometimes she would go around the piano and she would do a little thing or she would hum a song waiting for us to get up. And if she didn't see us coming, the more she would call maybe three times, maybe the three times remember, represented the Godhead, but she wouldn't pass three times. When she got to the third and if we were still in bed, the rod would do the speaking. It had gone to the point that we started sleeping on the thicker sheets so that when the rod comes, we wouldn't feel the, the, the sting of the rod. But she would uh, determine, she was determined that we would get up every single morning for worship. My father wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist then, but he supported her decisions. So when he saw the rod, rod coming, he would smile at it because he expected us to get up for worship. I commend her, I commend my parents for the way they grew us up uh, as children, but there's something I recognized while, while growing up, I became very boastful, boastful in the sense that when individuals asked which de denomination I'm from, I wasn't afraid to say I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I am from the, the remnant church, the commandment-keeping church. I felt very boastful. I, 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 I wanted to say it because I was convinced and still convinced that I'm a part of God's true church. But, but, but then I, I, I recognized that I, I became a legalist at keeping the Ten Commandments of God. So when an individual has asked if I, if I was ready for heaven, I said, yes, I am ready for heaven because I was convinced that I was keeping the Ten Commandments of God. I saw myself next to perfect. So once they asked which church I'm from, I was proud to say it. I remember one woman said to me, you are the first person I've ever met who have kept the commandments of God perfectly. <laughs> so I thought that I was ready for heaven. And I, I remember, and this is one of the things that, that, that affected our church in, in the past, because growing, growing up as a, as a youth, uh, I heard uh, many preachers just preaching about the commandments of God and less of Jesus. Yes, we believe in Jesus, but we preach a lot of commandments. But, but then I recognize, brothers and sisters, that if first of all, if we come to know Jesus for ourselves, uh, automatically we'll follow his commands. But if the first thing, if the first thing is to, to follow the commands and you don't know Jesus, that's going to be a problem. It's going to lead in legalism. Are you with me? And hence the reason there is one man who is called Emil Andreasson. He made a statement that I want to share with you as I get into the message. He said, in the last generation, God gives the final demonstration that men can keep the law of God and that they can live without sinning. It is necessary for God to produce at least one man who has kept the law perfectly. In the absence of such a man, God loses and Satan wins. I hope you heard that. In other words, he's saying if, if God is unable to produce this one man to keep his laws perfectly, then God is a loser. But listen to me, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ came to this earth and he kept the laws of God perfectly and that is enough. Are you listening to me? So no matter how much I tr try to keep the laws of God perfectly, I am not saved. You are not saved by keeping the laws of God. Because the Bible clearly says, for by grace, he are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. 
So if we think that the commandments of God can save us, then we're going to become very boastful and legalistic. And this is what I realized that plagued myself and as a, at the church while I was growing up. But I want to under, the church to understand that we owe our salvation to Jesus Christ. As you spend time in Ephesians chapter 2, there are three things quickly I want to share with you before I take my seat. It unfolds three important things why we are in need of a Savior. Number one, we are in need of a Savior because of our corruption in sin. We are in need of a Savior because we follow the ways of this world and we have been captured, incarcerated by the devil. And number three, we are in need of a Savior because we are children of wrath. Number one, or corruption in sin. The Bible says that we have been dead in trespasses and sin. This describes our past experience before we knew Jesus. A state of being lost under the dominion of death. Therefore, as a church, we never had any hope. As a people, we never had any hope. We were distant from God. We were alienated from his life. The Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and we were dead in sin. These words can be used interchangeably. Trespass means to slip aside. In other words, to deviate from the right path. Brothers and sisters, every single one of us deviated from God. We de deviated from uprightness. We deviated from the truth. We devi deviated from his commands. The Bible says that we were dead in trespasses. Not only that, but we, have, we were dead in sin. The, uh, this means that to miss the mark in the New Testament, brothers and sisters, it is an act of a person failing to obey the commands of God, failing to follow God's will. And for somebody who may be saying, preacher, you are not talking about me. You may be talking about somebody else. Let me remind you that the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 28, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the next time you think that you are so perfect, just remember that you are a sinner and we have to give God thanks for his grace. Are you still with me? No, number two, number two, the Bible says that we followed the ways of the world. We have been incarcerated by the devil. We followed the ways of the world. In the sense that instead we were subjugated by the evil age. Instead of thinking about heaven and the life to come, we, we, we allowed the world to, to, to show us exactly how we are to live. So the world, brothers and sisters, dictates our behavior, dictates our habits, dictates our attitude. We have been following the ways of the world, even though the Bible commands in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be he transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says that we conformed to the ways of the world. Our minds have been corrupted by sin, so even our actions have been corrupted. Are you still with the preacher? So brothers and sisters, the Bible says that we followed the ways of the world. Not only that, but we have been incarcerated by the devil. Now bear with the preacher today. The devil is the chief leader of the powers of darkness. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But let me interject some, some good news in this little part before I get to the sweet part of the message. Now watch this, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21, even though we wrestle against flesh and blood, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21, that we serve a God who is far above principalities and powers. Did you get that? So even though the devil is powerful, we serve a God who is all-powerful. He is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Are you still with me? 
but we can't overlook the fact that we have been under the bondage of the evil one. The Bible calls him the prince of this world, the prince of darkness, yes, uh, the God of this age. And the Bible also makes us understand that he is the ruler of demons. And now, I can remember when I was in college, I, I, I saw demon possession for the very first in my life. I have always been convinced that the devil is real. But at that moment, I came to the understanding that the devil is truly real. There were some individuals who were possessed by demons, and what they decided to do, they came up with a brilliant idea, they thought. They went into a little room, and they called some individuals who claimed that they were connected to Jesus. But I've re recognized something. There's one thing to say you know God, and it's another thing for God to say he knows you. Are you listening to me? So they went into this little room, and they began praying for these individuals. And all of a sudden, the demons began calling out their sins. The demons say, you can't pray for me or you're committing adultery. You can't, you can't pray for me, you're a liar. You can't pray for me, you're a thief. And at the, at the end, the room was empty, leaving these individuals in the room still possessed. But they had to call on some individuals who were truly connected with Jesus. And when they call on the name of Jesus, every one of them were set free. Are you listening to me? The devil is real, brothers and sisters. And if God be God, we better serve him. Are you listening to me? Amen. So we can't play games with the devil. Are you still with the preacher? Yeah. So the devil, brothers and sisters, he has captivated us. And the Bible says that he is the spirit, the spirit who, who has a compelling effect over God's children. And, and Paul makes us understand that the devil is so effective that Paul calls us children of disobedience. Not only that, but lastly, the Bible says that we have been children of wrath. The fact that you are born in this world, you are a child of wrath because you are born in sin. Somebody may be saying, preacher, you're still not talking about me, you're talking about somebody else. Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and also death passed upon all men for all have sinned. We all have been children of wrath, not even deserving of God's mercy. Instead of following the will of God, we have been following the will of the devil. What a gloomy picture. It seems so sad. As if there is no hope. But as I continued reading this passage, eventually I felt encouraged. Because in verse 4, it, it gave us two words that turned the entire story around. Are you listening to the preacher? Uh, the answer to our dilemma is found in two words, but God. Are you still with the preacher? We would not be here except for these two words, but God. These two words turn sorrow into joy, mourning into laughter, night into day. These two words, but God. The Bible says, but God, we were dead in trespasses and sin imprisoned by the devil, subjected to the wrath of God. But these two words, but God made the difference. Look at what the Bible says in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace he are saved, verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he hath showed the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. These two words, but God, made the difference. Are you still with the preacher? We were dead in sin. 
sin, but God made us alive in Christ Jesus. We were imprisoned by the devil, the prince of this world, but God made us alive in Christ Jesus and made us sit in heavenly places. No, no, no. When I got to this part of the passage and I, I saw heavenly places, I became confused. I said, Lord, you are living in heaven. And we are living on an earth that is full of sin. Yes. Yet you are saying that you have raised us up to sit in heavenly places. What are you trying to say? But as I kept reading, it, it, my eyes were open to this passage. Remember, I just told you that God raised up Jesus and, and he gave him an exalted position. So he is far above principalities and powers. Are you still with me? So Paul, uh, this exalted Christology is also used uh, in regards to God's children. Watch this, brothers and sisters. We were dead in trespasses and sin, but God has raised us up. Are you listening to me? And he has given us a, a position of superiority and authority over the kingdom of hell. Are you listening to me? So watch this. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that is available to the, to the church to live in this world. Are you listening to the preacher? I said this same power is available to God's children so I can stand up with authority and say, devil, the blood of Jesus is against you. I can stand up with authority and say, devil, in the name of Jesus, get thee hence. I can say, devil, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you because I am a child of the king. Are you listening to the preacher? I can stand up with authority and say, devil, man shall not live uh, by bread alone, uh, but by every word uh, that proceedeth uh, out of the mouth of God. Uh, these two words made the difference, uh, but God. Have mercy today. I say, brothers and sisters, but God uh, raised us up together so we can sit in heavenly places. Uh, we were children of wrath, uh, but God, uh, instead of pouring out wrath, uh, he poured out uh, his grace. Are you listening to me? Yeah, yeah. No, I've recognized that I'm happy that God is not like man. Yeah. Because when we are angry, yeah. we will take somebody's life. Yeah. But God's wrath is a holy anger. Are you listening to me? God's wrath is mixed with love and mercy. I told you last week, God is a God of justice. Are you listening to me? But God, these two words makes the difference. These two words, brothers and sisters, make us understand the difference between heaven and hell, between salvation and damnation. These two words makes us understand the difference between imprisonment and the freedom between doom and grace. These two words, but God makes a whole lot of difference. If you don't believe, and the Bible tells us about Joseph. Now, Joseph was sold into Egypt, and for 17 years, Joseph experienced a life of roughness. But Joseph, despite the life of roughness, he kept faithful to God. And eventually he became the prime minister of Egypt. No, his brothers had to come because of this great famine. And Joseph got the chance to have a talk with his brothers. And Joseph said, brothers, I forgive you. You meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to save the lives of many. Sometimes you can't understand what God is doing. But God says all things work together for good to them that love God. Brothers and sisters, these two words, but God makes a whole lot of difference. The Bible says in Romans uh, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, uh, Scarcely for a righteous man uh, will one die, yet per adventure for a good man uh, some may even dare to die. Uh, 
but God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I am happy for these two words, but God. The Bible says, I have not seen, hear, have heard, neither have entered into man the things that God hath prepared for his children, but God hath revealed him them unto us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, the deep things of God. I say these two words, but God makes a whole lot of difference. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as come unto man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. I say these two words, but God makes a whole lot of difference. Are you with the preacher today? We don't deserve to be alive, but God. Are you listening to me? We are unworthy, but God. We don't deserve his mercy, but God. We don't even deserve to be in church today, but God. We should have died in that accident, but God. We don't deserve his forgiveness, but God. Your child should have been dead, but God. I say you don't deserve his love or his mercy, but God. We could have been locked up in prison, but God. We could have been drug abusers, but God. I say I'm thanking God for this but God moment because God is a merciful God. Brothers and sisters, I am happy that God has butted in our lives. What do you say today? Because when God butts in, things can't remain the same. Are you listening to me? When God butts in, we are set free. When God butts in, miracles happen. When God butts in, we are forgiven. When God butts in, we are set free. When God butts in, burdens are lifted. When God butts in, problems are solved. When God butts in, the devil must flee. When God butts in, victory is assured. When God butts in, the battle is won. When God butts in, we can rejoice. When God butts in, we can smile at the storm as the ship goes sailing on. Do you give God thanks for a but God moment? Just give God thanks for a but God moment. Just lift your hands and praise the Lord. Just lift your hands and say hallelujah. Just lift your hands and say thank you Jesus. I am happy that God butted in our lives. Listen to me today. We have nothing to boast about. So you can tell men and women, I'm a part of the, the commandment keeping church. That's all right. But that can't save us. How can I receive freedom today? How can I be set free from the wrath of God? The Bible says, for by grace, I receive through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God.